thank you for your love for us and for the privilege that we have to come and worship you this morning. And thank you for the work that you're doing in our lives and that we can have confidence that you are accomplishing your will. And we just pray that you would help us as we seek to be a part of that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, when I was a younger man, I lived out in California. And uh, uh, I was an assistant manager of Kentucky Fried Chicken. And um, I'm really good at cooking chicken. Uh, if you ever, you know, have a need, it's good. Um, and one day I was taking out, you know, we would take the food out at the end of the night and we'd take it out to a dumpster and we would throw the dumpster, uh, the food into the dumpster. And uh, because you can't, you know, you can't sell it, you can't keep it, it has to be thrown away. Um, and one night I went out back to throw the food away, and there was a guy rummaging through the dumpster. And uh, um, I happened to have a bag full of food that I was about to throw away, so I just said, here, you know, rather than sure. dig through the dumpster, just, just take this and eat it. I probably could have gotten arrested by the, the EPA or somebody. Um, food and Drug Administration? Who knows? <laughs> But I saw it as an opportunity to share my faith with this guy, uh, share the gospel. So I started out explaining to him that you know, all of us are in need. He was in physical need right then. I didn't know if he was homeless or he said he lived, I uh, lived in the San Bernardino Valley. Uh, he said he lived on the other side of the mountain, uh, uh, San Bernardino Mountain. I don't know what he was talking about and how he would have gotten to where I was in Ontario, uh, California, but... Um, I started sharing the gospel with him, told him that, you know, we all have a need, just like he has a need physically, we all have a spiritual need, and that need is for a relationship with God, but that because we have something in our life that the Bible calls sin, that's the bad things that we do, that's a barrier that creates a barrier in our relationship with God. So in order to overcome that barrier, God sent his son Jesus into the world, who lived a perfect life, he was God in the flesh. And he died on the cross to pay for our sin debt so that we could be forgiven and have this relationship with God that uh, we all long for inside, not really knowing that that's the case. And so as I was sharing the gospel with this gentleman, uh, he said, uh, I get the whole heaven thing, okay? You die, you go to heaven. But what is this going to give me now? <laughs> Um, so, so I said, um, well, uh, you'll have uh, a relationship with God and, 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 uh, you know, God will be involved in your life and he'll reveal his will to you and you can do the works that he's called you to do, so on and so forth. And he said, you know, it's not enough. I'm looking for more. I want more from what, what you're talking about. And, you know, I, I'm tired of these Christians saying, oh, you're going to... You're going to die and go to heaven. I, I don't care about that. I want, I want what I need right now in this life. And um, Needless to say, he did not come to know Christ as his Savior. He did not trust Christ for his forgiveness in that, in that moment. Uh, and that, that stuck with me ever since. You know, the, the what can I get out of, what is Christianity going to give me now philosophy. And, you know, that philosophy is not just one held by uh, non-Christians. Uh, they're not just dissatisfied with Christianity because it doesn't offer them the things that they want. But Christians can, we as Christians can, can uh, alter our message. We can soften up our Christian message and promise things that God can't deliver, won't deliver on. God won't deliver on. Uh, I read, the, I just went online, looked for Christian uh, ministry uh, organizations that. Uh, have things to say about Christianity. And this is what one of those ministries said. Don't just accept whatever comes your way in life. You were born to win. You were born for greatness. You were created to be a champion in life. Okay. Uh, and and the, the idea I, I, got, I get from that is that it's all roses and, and butterflies, right? You know, life is... Once you accept Christ as your Savior, everything is grand and perfect and never 
you never have anything bad happen to you after that. You can all testify to that, right? But again, amen. Amen. It's a lie. We're, we're looking at this stewardship series, and we're looking at the life of Paul, especially in Acts chapter 20, where Paul is meeting with a group of, of believers from a place called Ephesus. He had spent two years with them previously, and he was on his way back to Jerusalem, where he would end up being arrested and then taken to Rome. Uh, and so on his way, he stopped to talk to these people. And last week, we talked about the stewardship of the gospel. That we are, we have a stewardship of what to, what how we're supposed to live, to to help validate the gospel, a lifestyle that validates the gospel. And this week we're talking about uh, being honest about what the gospel offers to the people around us. You know, we we try to share our faith. We try to be a witness at New Life Bible Church. We try to be evangelistic, go door to door, handing out flyers, and have services and do events. And we're doing all these things to share the gospel. Well, what happens when somebody actually listens? You know? When somebody actually responds and, and wants to know more about what you're talking about, what do we say? Do we say, do we try to soften the, the gospel message so that people are more receptive to it and more willing? And then once, they, we, once we got them hooked, <laughs> then we'll let God take care of the rest and show them how fun the Christian life really is at times. Right? No, we need to be honest. And that's what Paul is talking about here, I believe, in, in uh, Acts chapter 20, verses 22 through 26. So we're going to look at that. There's an outline sheet in your bulletin. If you wanted to take notes, the verses are going to be up on the screen. But Paul continues his, his conversation with uh, the Ephesian <coughs> Christians in verse 22. He says, And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. Wait a minute. What's Paul saying is going to happen to him? Bad, stuff. Gonna Bad things are going to happen. You, you, tribulation. Do you, do you look fondly on the times in your life when you're going to suffer tribulation? Tribulation is like, you know, terrible kind of things. And... Uh, Heather was talking about Blaine and, and her physical issues. And a lot of people have, have a lot of trouble in this life. And that's what tribulations are. They're troubles. And, you know, you could say, well, you know, troubles are just a byproduct of living in a, in a fallen world. And that's true, that they are. But trouble is m more than that. And uh, as we talk about Christianity, there are times when God wants us to go in to trouble. Yes, sir. Right? Sometimes he wants us to go into trouble. Sometimes he, he leads us into trouble. Um, there's a, a passage that I want to look at. It's 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 12. Uh, this, is, this is a Christian doctrine. This is what we should be talking about as Christians. It says in verse 10, But you have uh, carefully followed my doctrine. This is Paul talking to his uh, protege Timothy. My doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at, I at Antioch, in Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And he got stoned. I mean, physically stoned to death there. Okay? Uh, but he says, And out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will have wonderful days and never any trouble again. <laughs> what version are you reading? <laughs> this is the new, the new Pastor Tracy version. <laughs> <laughs> will suffer persecution. Okay, the, the Christianity that, that God talks about in the Bible, that, that, that Paul lived, that he believed, was one that you can expect that if you're going to follow God's will, it's going to lead you into trouble sometimes. Not all the time. Most of, most of the Christian life for us is, is okay. It's good, in fact. But there are times when God calls us to go into the trouble. Into the trouble that, that He wants us to dive into for the sake of being a light for His gospel in the world today. To the furnace. Like the, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to go into the fiery furnace. 
And he said, uh, God delivered me out of them all. Uh, up to that point, that deliverance was that he got to get out of the situation with his life. But it didn't end that way. God uh, had Paul continuing to, to be a witness, to be uh, sharing his faith. And he ended up, after the imprisonment that he was subjected to uh, uh, after he, he got to Jerusalem on this trip, he was freed from that. But then he was arrested again. And that time, he, he lost his head. They, they executed him. And that is deliverance from persecution. It's, as it says, and out of them all he delivered me. God delivered Paul from persecution finally. He never had to suffer any more persecution after he had his head chopped off. He got to go to heaven and be with God forever. There's deliverance. May not be deliverance physically, but it's deliverance ultimately that we can look forward to. So God was leading Paul into tribulation and Paul was following. All right, let's move on in verse 24. It says, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul was determined to do the job called, uh, God had called him to do. He was determined. He was moving forward, even though he was very suspicious of the fact that he might lose his life as a result of it. What does the Bible have to say about that? Did Jesus say, you know, you can expect uh, big cars, fancy houses, attractive husbands? You've been watching TV that, again. That was, that was the, 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 ladies, for the ladies there. Um, flat abs, big biceps. A full head of hair. <laughs> Is the, are these the things God's promising us today? What is this? Look at Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 27. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. So Jesus is saying, you know, you've got to give it up. You've got to lay down your life. And I, 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 he's saying that generally speaking, you know. Uh, as, as I try to live my life, I, I try not to live my life for myself. I'm not trying to live my life for my own purposes, my own agenda. I'm trying to live my life, trying to live my life for the sake of being a witness and doing the work that God has called me to do. I don't always do well at it, but that's my goal. Uh, and and that's, that's what he's talking about here, that we shouldn't just be living our lives for ourselves but we should be living our lives for God every day, trying every day to live our life for God. But more than that, the chances is that by laying my life down and saying, God, I'm willing to do what you want me to do and go where you want me to go, it could mean that I'm going to end up dead because of it. Luke 21, 12 through 19 says, but before all these things, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's telling them about the end. The end is coming. I need a big placard. It says the end is coming. Is the end coming? Yes, the end is coming. Jesus is coming back someday, right? And he was telling his disciples what to look for as they look toward the end of this age, which I certainly know is coming soon. Uh, and so he finishes talking to them and he says, before all these things, talking to his disciples, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers in my name's sake, but it will turn out for you as on occasions for testimony. Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which will all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. You will be betrayed, even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, 
and they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will be lost. By your patience, possess your souls. So, you know, yeah, we, we need to lay our life down, but it also can mean death. It can mean to die. Right now, things are pretty comfortable in the United States for Christians. And I don't know how comfortable they really are, but if you go in other parts of the world, in, in some Muslim countries and uh, other other uh, Hindu countries, uh, you can you can lose your life, you can lose your house, you can lose your job, you can lose all of your possessions because you're a Christian. And it's happening all over the world. It could happen here. And Paul was aware that following God's plan for his life could lead to his death. He knew that. So as we're sharing the gospel, should we? I don't know if we should add this into it, but you know, Jesus died for your sins, and he wants to pay for those. And you can be forgiven by trusting in him for your forgiveness, that his payment for your sins is enough to get to heaven. And once you do that, you could die. I don't know if I'm going to add that into my gospel presentation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But that's, that's the truth. About, in, in some places in the world, that's what they're having to tell the people they're sharing the gospel with. That you, you could... I, I, you need to understand, though, that if you trust Christ for your forgiveness, you could die. You could lose your life. Paul was aware that following God's plan for his life could lead to his death. So, first, God was leading Paul into tribulation and Paul was following. Second, Paul was aware that following God's plan for his life could lead to his death. Now let's look at verse 25. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no longer. That was the last time they saw Paul. That relationship was over. He would never see them again. Look at Matthew chapter 19, verse 27 through 29. Can we expect that? Can we expect that as Christians? Look at what Peter, Peter is having a wonderful conversation with Jesus, and he's always sticking his foot in his mouth. Almost always. And he says to the Lord, See, we've left all and followed you. So what shall we have? I've given up every, we've given up everything, God. We've given up our jobs, our family, our home. We've given up everything for you, Jesus. What are we going to get? Sound familiar? Sounds like that guy at the dumpster that I, I met in California. A long time ago. <laughs> and so Jesus says to him, Assuredly I say to you that in the regeneration... Are you looking for the regeneration? You know, I, I read this over and over, and, and in the regeneration, what is that? What is that? What is regeneration? It's where I get rid of this old dead body, this old dying body, and it's replaced with a perfect, painless, never tired, Joyful. never hungry, what was that? Joyful. Joyful, perfect body, right? That's the regeneration. We're all looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to it. When the Son of Man sits on the throne of His glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones. Now, obviously, I'm not sitting on a throne, and I don't think any of you are. But I think he's talking specifically to the disciples there, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. But in verse 29, he says something that applies to all of us. It says, And everyone who has left houses, or brothers or sisters, or father or mother, or wife or children or lands, for my sake, my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and inherit eternal life. So there are relationships that are going to end. I mean, that's the unfortunate truth, but we, 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 it, it's a part of the life that God is calling us to, is to not, we're not always going to be able to stay connected with people. And so there are relationships that are going to end. So Paul was aware that following God's plan for his life meant something, meant sometimes relationships end. Why am I telling you this? Look at verse 26. So Paul talks about the fact that he was following God in tribulation, that 
God's plan for his life could lead to his death, that God's plan for his life would end his relationships with them. In verse 26 he says, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to, to declare to you the whole counsel of God. And that's what we're talking about, the whole counsel of God. The message of God is, is, is forgiveness through Jesus Christ. The Christian life, though, look what it costs. You know, you'll have to look at your sermon outline sheet for this, I think. Maybe not. Let's we'll see how good Garrett really is. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> no pressure. All right. Uh, what it costs. Here's what Paul says it costs. Persecutions, afflictions, the things that happened to him at Iconium, Antioch, and Lystra. And then in verse 25 of Matthew, Jesus says, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my, my sake will find it. And then Jesus says to Peter, or Peter says to Jesus, we have left all and followed you, therefore what shall we have? The Christian life costs something. And anybody who says different is trying to sell you something. But, that was a quote from tonight. <coughs> you caught it. But, we get something in return. Look at the, the following set of things. We get the promise that even though we suffer persecutions and tribulations, that God is going to deliver us from them all. Amen. And that might be today. It might be out of the situation. It might be freedom in this world from whatever it is that we're suffering from. But it can also mean to ultimate deliverance, which is the deliverance of me getting rid of this body and being with Jesus in heaven forever. And then it says in Matthew, For the Son of Man will come in His glory, the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He will reward each according to His works. So what I do here for the glory of God, which is what we talked about last time, we talked about the fact that we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to uh, receive the things done in our bodies, whether good or bad. We, all of our lifetime as Christians will be Put in a furnace, and everything that is wood, hay, and stubble, everything I've done for myself out of the wrong attitude and the wrong heart will be burned up. The things that I've done for God, for the glory of God, with the right heart and the right mind, will last. And I will be rewarded for those things by Christ in heaven. And then, in verse 29 of Matthew 19, Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or child or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. A hundredfold and inherit eternal life. So Paul was honest about the benefits of becoming a Christian, but he was also honest about the cost. You know, as, as we get closer to the end of our days here on earth, the end of this age, we are going to see a more hostile, a growing hostile environment toward us as Christians. And so as we share the gospel, we need to be willing to be stewards of the whole counsel of God, good stewards of the whole counsel of God, and be honest with people that, yes, you're going to end up in heaven. Yes, God is going to be with you for the rest of your life. He's going to work in your life, but it's going to mean trouble. Because we don't want people trusting in Christ for the forgiveness because it's going to be easier for them. We want people to trust Christ for the forgiveness because they realize that they're sinners and that this is the only option we have for forgiveness. Not out of what I'm going to get in this life, but what I need from God. So as we share the gospel, we need to be careful not to sugarcoat the Christian life. There's great joy and fulfillment in living for Christ, but it isn't easy. And we need to be honest about that. You know, I'm, I'm discipling a new believer right now, and, uh, you know, 
be honest about, okay, this, this isn't easy. This is a challenge. There are struggles in a Christian life, and you have to work at it. It doesn't just happen. You have to work at it. God's given you everything you need to succeed, but you have to work at it to make it work. So in the coming years, we're sharing the gospel. We're going to share the whole counsel of God, right? Yeah. All right? Lord, thank you for the chance that we have to worship you. And I pray that you would encourage us as we share the gospel to share the whole, your whole counsel. Not just the good things, although we need to share those good things, but also to be willing to share the hard things, the difficult challenges that we face, that you ask us to face because we're your children. God, give us strength to be uh, forthright in, in the way that we do this in the way that we present the gospel, help us to present in a way that honors you and is honest about what you're offering. And we just pray that you'd work in the hearts of the people that we've shared the gospel with already and those who we will share it with, that you would draw them into your forgiveness. Lord, we thank you for your love for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.